Hello everyone. Today's topic which we will be delving into is the personality theory by Harry Stack Sullivan which is also called the interpersonal theory of personality. Before delving into the theory of Harry Stack Sullivan Let's talk about a little bit about biography of Sullivan. So Harry Stack Sullivan was born in a small farming town of Norwich, New York on February 21st, 1892. He was the sole surviving child of the parents. His mother was Ella Stack Sullivan and the father was Timothy Sullivan. Ella Stack Sullivan actually had given birth to two other sons but unfortunately neither of whom lived past the first year. As a preschool child, Sullivan neither had friends nor acquaintances of his own age. After beginning school, he felt like an outsider because mainly uh, he was an Irish Catholic boy in a Protestant community. His thick Irish accent and quick-mindedness actually made him unpopular with his classmates throughout his years of schooling in Smyrna. This incident which I am going to talk about next is actually very important and has left quite a remark on Sullivan's life. So when Sullivan was eight and a half years old, he formed a close friendship with a 13-year-old boy whose name was Clarence Bellinger. They had much in common socially and intellectually. Both were considered socially retarded but advanced intellectually. Both later became psychiatrists and neither of them married. The relationship between Harry and Clarence had a transforming effect on Sullivan's life. It is said that it awakened him uh, in him the power of intimacy. Uh, that is the ability to love another being who was more or, less, more or less like himself. In Sullivan's mature theory of personality, he placed a heavy emphasis on the therapeutic, almost magical power of an intimate relationship during pre-adolescent years. In Sullivan's case, which I would like to add that his sexual orientation may have prevented him from gaining the acceptance and recognition he might have had if others had not suspected of his homosexual orientation. Um, in the American society, actually, at that point of time, uh, during Sullivan's time, actually, the mental health workers found it very difficult to admit their indebtedness to a psychiatrist whose homosexuality was commonly known. Also, homosexuality being a sin in the community was very prevalent. So. Sullivan could have achieved a greater fame, but unfortunately was shackled by sexual prejudices that kept him from being regarded, regarded as um, America's foremost psychiatrist of the first half of the 20th century. So this was a bias against him. And as psychology students, uh, people in the field, we must understand that this field also had its own evils at certain points of time. Moving on to the interpersonal theory, uh, here I'm just going to talk about in a small gist that according to Sullivan, he believed that people develop their personality within social context which is the environment the person is living in he emphasized the importance of various developmental stages which was the infancy childhood the juvenile era pre early late adolescence and the adulthood 
um he said that healthy human development rest on the person's ability to establish intimacy with the other person but something which interferes with this ability is the anxiety and anxiety can interfere with satisfying interpersonal relationships at any age according to him the most important stage of development is pre adolescence you will see that he has emphasized this continuously throughout his theory that the most important stage of development is pre adolescence to understand how this interpersonal relationship affects a human being he started uh, working with the schizophrenics and then he later moved to patients uh, of an obsessive kind something interesting which i would like to add is that uh, his residence in new york when he was uh, doing his personal practice in new york uh, brought him to into contact with several other psychiatrists uh, mainly european psychiatrists like karen hornay eric from and with them along with clara thompson they formed the zodiac group where they discussed old and new ideas in psychiatry now coming to the theory there are certain concepts which we must learn before moving on with sullivan's main theory which is the developmental stages which you will see in some time before that let's clarify few of the concepts so he talked about tension now what is tension tension is the potentiality for action potentiality for action that may or may not be experienced in awareness which means either it can be unconscious or conscious sullivan recognized two types of tension which are needs and anxiety needs are tensions brought on by by the uh, biological imbalance imbalance between a person and its physiochemical environment which is both external and internal now needs are episodic episodic what does this mean it means that once it is satisfied they temporarily lose their power but after some time it can again reoccur like hunger when we are hungry it's episodic we eat and it's gone and then again we might be hungry again in 2 3 hours so that is needs sullivan says that the most basic interpersonal need is tenderness an infant develops a need to receive tenderness from its primary caretaker uh for example when the infants need to receive tenderness usually the infant only receives but never gives tenderness the the responsibility to give tenderness is basically of uh, the primary care taker to the infant let me write that so when the infant wants tenderness it may express it by crying smiling cooing and when the mother needs to give tenderness it is satisfied through the use of infant's mouth and mother's hand so the mother might pat the baby if it's crying the mother might uh, feed the baby with her hands now needs can be of two types mainly that is general needs and then we have the zonal needs 
Now what happens in the general needs? Our general needs are like oxygen, food, water and zonal needs arise from particular areas of the body. Particular areas of the body. Now different zonal needs can also uh, able to produce the general needs and the zonal needs both. For example, like the mouth is a zonal area but it satisfies general needs by taking in food and oxygen and also uh, satisfies zonal needs for other oral activities. Other oral activities what kind? Like babies put uh, toys in the mouth or whatever they see, they want to feel it, they put it in the mouth. That is an oral activity and putting things in the mouth actually gives them pleasure. So that's a zonal need and an oral activity. Food, oxygen, water, these are general needs. Needs are usually productive in nature. The needs lead to some productivity, some productive action. Whereas the other need, which is the anxiety, leads to non-productive needs. Uh, sorry, uh, leads to non-productive behaviors. Non-productive now let's see what is anxiety what basically uh, Sullivan is trying to say anxiety is anxiety he says is the disruptive force blocking the development of healthy interpersonal relationship now needs is a type of tension which helps in building interpersonal relationship because when the baby is wanting tenderness from the mother the mother and the mother is uh, providing it mother or anybody in the mothering role is providing it there is a relationship forming but what anxiety does is that it is uh, interfering in the healthy development of interpersonal relationships so Sullivan talks about how actually the anxiety develops or originates in a person. Sullivan said that it is transferred from parent to the infant through the process of empathy. Now you might be very confused. How is empathy leading to anxiety? It is said that anxiety in the mothering one inevitably induces anxiety in the infant. How? Because all mothers or again all mothers or anybody in the mothering role may have some amount of anxiety that is normal while caring for the babies. All infants will become anxious to some degree. It makes people incapable of learning. It impairs memory. It narrows perception and may also result in complete amnesia. That is what it is saying extreme anxiety can do. Sullivan says that the two things which two things which are completely undesirable are anxiety. and loneliness. Because anxiety is very painful, people have the natural tendency to avoid it and inherently preferring a state of euphoria, which is a complete lack of tension. To reduce, people want to be in euphoria now we know that it cannot be possible a person cannot be euphoric all the time 
and it is also not possible that a person's life is completely lack of anxiety or tension now what is energy transformations the small thing here tensions that are transformed into actions are either covert or overt are called energy transformations that is it tensions that are transformed into actions there is a transformation of energy needs help in forming inter interpersonal bond anxiety disrupts that bond now any kind of tension which is turning into any kind of action that is your energy transformation now it could be either overt or covert people might know that there are obvious actions which would be overt but it could be in the form of emotions thoughts which could be covert emotions thoughts these are covert in nature now moving on to the next slide we will talk about dynamisms so we talked about energy transformations now energy transformations become organized as a typical behavior pattern when your tensions are becoming into actions and those repeated actions become a behavior pattern which characterize a person's entire life so Sullivan called these behavior patterns dynamism. Dynamism is nothing but behavior patterns. Now these could also be traits or habits of a person. there are mainly three which he is talking about the first one is malevolence it is equal to evil or hatred what is it exactly it is disjunctive dynamism of evil and hatred characterized by feeling of living among one's enemy like everybody is my enemy it usually originates uh, around the originates around the age of 2 or 3 years when children's action that are earlier had brought up maternal tenderness are met with anxiety and pain basically tenderness so basically what is happening is that the child performs certain actions till the age of 1 1 and a half to even 2 years the actions are getting maternal tenderness but the same actions when the child is doing at the age of 2 or 3 years old they are not being faced with maternal tenderness but in fact they are actually ignored and not given much attention to which is leading to anxiety and pain so when parents attempt to control their parent children's behavior by physical pain or reproving remarks and instead of maternal tenderness which the child is seeking he is faced with physical pain it could be beating or certain remarks which the child does not like or the child was not seeking these was was seeking tenderness but did not get so what happens some children will learn to hold, withhold any expression of the need of tenderness 
by protecting them of adopting malevolent attitude what is happening let's see child seeks tenderness does not get it like till the age of one one and a half years old if the child is crying a lot the person in the mothering role might come and uh, try to pat the child or try to make him calm but at the age of two two and a half three years old when the child is crying very loudly he is not getting that pat on the back or he is not getting that love but instead he is uh, getting beatings or uh, remarks which he is not liking does not get it what the child is doing that the child now is withholding withholding any expression of the need for tenderness he is completely withholding it and then what It, what parents and peers find it even more difficult to actually work with the child which is in again it's a cycle it is a vicious cycle it again solidifies the child's negative attitude towards the world so the, again parents are trying to coax the child into talking with them or wanting to talk with the child about his attitude but the child is protecting himself by being even even more malevolent now what what kind of actions are these these are form of timidity mischievousness cruelty and other kinds of a social or anti social behavior which behaviors which are not accepted in the society he is acting out as it is said mainly those externalizing and internalizing behaviors so this is malevolence intimacy grows out of again intimacy also grows out of tenderness but it involves a close interpersonal relationship between two people between two people of equal status it develops prior to pu- uh, puberty ideally during preadolescence when it usually exists between two children each of whom sees the other as a person of equal value it has to be equal status or equal value it cannot be between parent and a child because they do not consider themselves to be equal to each other but when they are adults Uh, and see each other as equals they can form intimacy now intimacy must not be confused with uh, sexual interest um, or lust lust we will be talking about next it is a uh, a tendency to draw out loving reactions from the other person and thereby it decreases anxiety and loneliness two extremely painful experiences which we talked about earlier coming to lust lust is a isolating tendency now for lust even if there is a love object it's not needed it requires no other person for its satisfaction like in intimacy there needs to be two people but in lust it is an isolating tendency which to not need another person it manifests as auto erotic behavior auto erotic with herself or himself there is no second person there is no need of second person even if uh, the another person is the object of one's lust there can be a second person who is the object of a person's lust but lust do not need a second person it's auto erotic it is mainly during 
adolescence now lust is usually uh, it leads to reduction of self esteem because uh, attempts of lustful activity are not really accepted by the society by the majority of the society uh, now when it's uh, it's a uh, unconscious i can say unconscious subconscious nature of the society not to accept lust so when such things happen it increases anxiety and decreases the feelings of self worth now what is self system self system is the inclusion of all dynamisms all dynamisms now basically self system is there to reduce anxiety nothing else it's the entire self system which tells you that there there is something which is causing anxiety so it reduces it and this is more of a interpersonal situation because as we saw earlier also that sullivan said that a personality cannot be formed if there is no society if there is no social environment and this is the same self system is there inside the interpersonal situation and the entire motive of self system is to uh, let the self system know that there is something anxiety provoking and to reduce it all the kind of behaviors there are to reduce anxiety when the self system is in danger people try to defend themselves now when the self system itself is in danger people try to defend themselves by using something called something called security operations now security operations are mainly of two types that is dissociation dissociation includes those impulses and desires and needs that a person refuses to allow into awareness uh some infantile experiences like a uh, few babies behavior they are neither rewarded nor punished so those experiences simply do not become part of the self system these do not become part of the self system but they are present in the unconscious and affect the personality they do not cease to exist but it continuously influences their personality again as i said on a unconscious level so the second one is the selective inattention i'll give you an example for selective inattention which will help you like somebody who thinks that he abides by law uh all the time he never never breaks traffic laws uh is never uh, has crossed a red signal if he is thinking like that if he is regarding himself like that he actually might just forget about the many occasions that he exceeded the speed limit or the times when he failed to stop at a sign completely so what is happening that these selective attention uh, we 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 provide to certain things in the environment which might trigger us which we might think are not part of this uh, our personalities if this is a personality and we do something this but we do not consider this part of our personality so we might just give selective attention to this we do not even consider that we have done this but we have done this and this is part of our uh, personality but we do not consider this to be part of our personality so that is how we are protecting actually our system self system
moving to personifications so beginning in infancy and continuing through out the various developmental stages people acquire certain images of themselves and others images of themselves and others these images are called personifications now th there is a bad mother and good mother personification so what is happening so we might have uh, you might have heard in the melanie klein klein's uh, theory of good breast and bad breast it is something similar like that so bad mother and good mother what is happening so here it is actually the person mothering who is giving the mothering role is giving the care he he or she might not be the actual mother so when the nipple belongs to the mother it could be a bottle also nipple or bottle when never the baby is feeling hungry and he is not getting the bottle or the nipple and the mother essentially the mother is not able to satisfy the hunger needs so that becomes a bad mother what is a good mother again after some time or uh, when the child is getting properly fed whenever he wants and he is the mother is cooperative with the child that becomes the good mother now these personifications are based on the person's uh, person not infant's perception of an either anxious malevolent mother and other which is the calm tender mother the anxious malevolent mother is not the bad, bad mother and the calm tender mother is the good mother and until uh, the child is reaching an age where uh, language development is happening these can coexist during mid infancy mid infancy the child creates certain personifications about himself which is the bad me good me and not me so again each of them are related to the evolving conception of me and my body means the infant and his body so now the bad me personification is uh, formed from the experiences of punishment and disapproval that infants receive from the mothering one the part of the infant which is getting disapproval is the bad me and again the resulting anxiety is very strong enough to teach infants that they are bad but it is not so severe to cause the experience to be completely dissociated or selectively unattended inattended then if it would have been dissociated and selectively inattended what would happen there would wouldn't have been a bad me because it has been dissociated or selectively inattended it's not part of his consciousness but the bad me is part of the consciousness here uh, which is which is a part where the child is actually getting disapproval from the mothering person the good me is the personification from infant's experiences with reward and approval this is a part which which the child is getting approval from the mothering one now what is not me <clears throat> these are formed formed during 
severe anxiety however may cause an infant to form the not me personification and to either dissociate or selectively inattend experiences related to the anxiety the anxiety is so great that in this case what is happening is the not me is being selectively inattended selectively inattended or dissociation is happening not me is not part of consciousness anymore it becomes the part of unconscious but it keeps on having an influence on the person now what is eidetic personification eidet eidetic personification is a interpersonal relationship but not with a real person now i said sullivan did not have friends of a lot of friends he also had certain eidetic personification eidetic personification is basically relations with imaginary friends or traits now why did i say traits so basically children create certain imaginary friends with certain traits which he or she would like in that imaginary friend this sort these certain friends are formed in the imagination in order to protect their self esteem sullivan believed that these imaginary friend may be as significant to the child's development as real playmates because when he when the children is creating imaginary friends he is creating those friends with the exact traits he would want in a real life friend and those imaginary friends are acting as the child would want a real friend to act out so these friends are actually increasing the self esteem of the child and these might be as important as real playmates as sullivan has said moving on to levels of cognition there are three levels of cognition uh, prototaxic parataxic and syntaxic so levels of cognition are the ways of ways of perceiving imagining and conceiving experiences now these all the three levels of cognition happen at different ages the most earliest and most primitive experience of an infant take place at a prototaxic level which is the most primitive because these experiences cannot be communicated with others they are difficult to describe or define one way to understand the term is to imagine the earliest subjective experiences of a newborn baby now the neonate might feel hunger and pain these are prototaxic experiences like neonates hunger and pain because these cannot be explained or communicated with the others they are difficult to describe because it's a child and these prototaxic experiences result in observable action like if the child is hungry he will cry prototaxic cognition leads to 
observable action like crime it cannot be communicated in words but it can be resulted in observable actions parataxic so before moving on to parataxic let me tell you something about prototaxic now prototaxic can happen even in adults how can happen even in adults so how is that happening uh let me give you an example sometimes people say that they tell another person that they just had a very strange sensation one that they cannot put into words now these strange sensation they cannot put into words uh these are momentary sensations or any kind of feelings uh, images moods and impressions now these primitive image of dream or waking life uh, they're not completely unconscious uh sorry they're not completely unconscious they're somewhat in subconscious preconscious level in between and it's strange again they cannot explain what it was to the other person they might understand what it was but they are not able to explain it to the other person so these are the prototaxic experiences at a adult level parataxic experiences are usually when the person assumes there is a cause and effect relationship between two events which occur coincidentally like if a person if a child is um that occur co in c dentally like if a child is always saying please for candy and the child has learned this behavior of saying please for a candy now the the word please itself is not giving the child a candy there is somebody a person who has to dispense the candy to the person to the child now when such a person such a child might grow up they might ask god or imaginary people to grant favors now a good bit of the adult behavior which we project comes from parataxic thinking now again parataxic thinking parataxic thinking is not something um it's definitely clearly more clearer than prototaxic but this is also something um it's a kind of illogical belief that a cause and effect relationship exists uh but actually does not between two events but actually does not it's just that they are so much in close temporal proximity that people tend to believe that it's a cause and effect relationship now moving on to the syntactic level syntactic level is uh when experiences are consensually validated and that can be symbolically con- communicated now what does consensually validated mean consensually validated now suppose um i say the laptop i say the definition of laptop if i say the definition of laptop uh, i might say that it's an electronic device which helps me to do online work now two three or thousands of people might consensually validate this certain definition so that's a syntactic level like when we wave hand it's usually uh, in many cultures saying bye bye to the person so that is a syntactic level communication when 
the gesture is not personal but consensually validated between two to three other people also understand that kind of uh, behavior gesture that is syntactic level and the most common being the language we every day use if i'm using a language you are not able to understand that's not syntactic if i'm using a language only i understand that's not syntactic if i'm using a language including i'm including words and gestures which you understand and everybody else understands at least the most of the population understand that's a syntactic level and syntactic level usually comes in the child as they as they develop non verbal communication communication that is how syntactic till then syntactic level comes into play next moving on to the developmental stages starting off with infancy in, in infancy uh infancy it is usually uh till the age of 18 to 24 months which is one and a half years to two years and sullivan believed that the human becomes the infant becomes a human through the tenderness he is receiving from the mother from the mothering person the person at the mothering role so the mothering role is very important and tenderness is giving uh, tenderness which is changing infancy to human now again uh, as we have learned before also the linkage between the mother and the infant knowingly and unknowingly leads to development of anxiety even for the baby and the anxiety might lead from spring from different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of uh, experiences and the important learnings uh, is the good mother and the bad mother and the good and the bad me because when the uh, the nipple is there for the baby to have his food or her food it is a good mother and when the nipple is not there then it's a bad mother the accepted parts of the infant becomes the good me and the uh, and the parts which he finds disapproval is the bad me two major things which you have to know that protects the baby from death is apathy and somnolent 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 detachment uh so basically apathy and somnolent detachment what it does is that it's a, it's a built in protection of the baby and even when the child is not getting appropriate care tenderness as sullivan said this will help the child from death like even in hunger the child may fall asleep because of these two certain things apathy and somnolent that a uh, de- uh, detachment another thing during mid infancy during mid infancy is the autistic language basically it's a private language which makes little to no sense to other people uh, and the early communication usually takes place in the form of facial expression and sounding of certain phone uh, phonemes the childhood stage the age range is again uh, from 18 to 24 months to about 5 to 6 years during uh, this stage the mother uh, remains the most significant other person but 
her role is different from what it was in infancy the dual personification of mother are now fused into one dual personification means the good and the bad mother here what happens is infused into one and the child's uh, view is that the mother is more congruent now it's not separated into good me or bad me but sorry good me a good mother or the bad mother but it's a congruent mother that can have both kinds of uh, traits Uh, in addition to combining the mother personification, the child differentiates various persons who previously formed the concept of the mothering role, separating mother and father and seeing as having a distinct role. Now, previously, if the father is feeding the child with the bottle or the mother is feeding the child with the bottle, both essentially remains the mothering role. Both essentially is fulfilling the mothering role. But as the child grows goes into the stage of childhood he or she is separating the mother and the father and seeing them seeing them having distinct role that's why it's the parents the significant others here is the parent and another important thing is the imaginary playmate so besides their parents preschool aged children often have other significant relationships as well uh, which is an imaginary playmate this is the eidetic friend now they might they might talk with the friend they might ask their parents to save a seat for the the friend or even uh, they they see the eidetic friend as a real friend so and many adults also recall their uh, their experiences as a child having imaginary playmates. And Sullivan says that a lot of uh, um, uh, there is um, a lot of uh, notion that having uh, eidetic friends or imaginary friends is not a good sign. And this, but he says that it's it's very safe and it's not a sign of instability or pathology but it's a positive event which helps children be ready for intimacy with real friends during the pre-adolescent stage which he says that the pre-adolescent stage is the most important stage because that's where the child is learning intimacy see the most important stage this the the imaginary playmates help the child to have uh, real playmates in real world uh, and nowadays uh, if you if you ask if you tell or ask doctors psychotherapists um, people in the field that my child is talking to an imaginary friend this would be considered a very normal activity in their uh, age group uh, during the juvenile uh, era the most important is uh, they see the other playmates as of equal status they learn they uh, competition is found among uh, children of the same age group and they learn how to compromise cooperate during this uh, period which is the juvenile era now as again Sullivan says pre-adolescent being the very important uh, age group because the child is learning intimacy with a single person a very close person in the in the early adolescence moving on to the early adolescence early adolescence is the beginning of puberty it's important because early adolescence is 13 to 15 years old and it's the beginning of puberty and uh, it is it is uh, the period which is which where there is a need for sexual love with only one person 
it is marked by eruption of genital interest and advent of lustful relationships um majorly in united states it's seen that early adolescence is generally parallel with the middle school years uh even so in other countries also almost as well the need for uh, intimacy achieved during preceding stage continues uh, during uh, these stages as well now there might be several friends but um, the sexual love is with one person they learn the balance of lust like too many there should not be too many people with um for the child that too many people with having lust for too many people or uh, there is creation of intimacy with a single person which is a sexual love with a single person and the development of security so late adolescence coming to the last stage it's uh, the discovery of the self and the world outside self that to understand there is a world which does not really just revolve around them but there is a world where there are certain different things and they that they, they learn certain different things so uh, successful late adolescence actually includes a uh, growing syntactic mode um when they go to college or workplace or ha- for higher education they begin exchanging ideas with others and having their opinions and beliefs either either it is validated or repudiated either ex- accepted into the world or not accepted into the world and people uh they have learned to accept when their ideas are not accepted because as we have learned through the previous good me bad me they have learned that if their ideas are not accepted that they are okay with it they are learning from others to live in an adult world and then through this there is a successful journey um if there is a successful journey from for all these stages then a person can adjust to the real world successful journey through all stages leads to proper adjustment in the world so this was sullivan's theory and i hope you have understood if you want the materials and notes i would i would email them to you if anybody needs they can leave a comment down below thank you